The Agile Practice Guide is PMI's publication for Agile, whether you're taking the PMP, the PMI ACP, the CAPM, and other certifications. It's important you know what's in it. So let's get through it in 10 minutes. The Agile Practice Guide Summary. What is Agile, first and foremost? Agile is a mindset. It is a way you should process the world around you. It is a way you should think. It's a way that you should pivot according to the world around you and what is happening. I've been a scrum master since 2011. I've got all sorts of other certifications in Agile. I've got six certifications that are Agile related. I'm very passionate about you understanding this guide, hence the review. This is the breakdown of the chapters. There's an introduction, an introduction to Agile, life cycle selection, which is pretty important, implementing Agile, Implementing Agile, delivering in an Agile environment. Chapter six is about organizational considerations for project agility. And chapter seven is a call to action. Let's talk about chapter one. The summary is why this guide? This guide is important because PMI takes a project spin on Agile and presents it in this publication. So it is relevant, especially now we're going into the world of hybridization definitely one you want to know about. Let's go to chapter two. It's called an introduction to agile. Two types of work, definable work and high uncertainty work. If you're working on high uncertainty projects, you want to use an agile approach because it's better to cope with change and complexity. Definable work, it's better for you to use a predictive approach. The agile manifesto is talked about in this book and we've got four values. I'm going to give you the summary value individuals and how they interact more than processes and tools, value working software over comprehensive documentation, value customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and value responding to change over following a plan. You can find a full manifesto at agilemanifesto.org. Now, on top of that, there's also an understanding of the principles, and I'm gonna give you a different spin for the Agile Manifesto principles. I break them into people principles. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. Welcome changing requirements so that you can add value to your customer and enable them harness change for their competitive advantage. Build projects around motivated individuals. The most efficient and effective method of communicating is face-to-face -face conversation. Process, agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace indefinitely. Still on process, you gotta pay attention to technical excellence. It'll save you a whole lot of fan cleaning. Simplicity is the art of maximizing the amount of work not done. Don't do busy work. At regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective. They tune and adjust accordingly after retrospective. Business. Business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project, deliver work in software frequently. Why? Because you're doing things in small iterations and you need to deliver quick so that we can inspect and understand if you're going in the right direction. Work in software is a primary measure of progress. We don't do percent completes in the world of Agile. And the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. And those are the 12 principles at a very high level. The PMI has a really helpful table here that helps you see how each value is explained and how each principle is explained across the chapters. So when I think about Agile as presented in this book, we've got four values, 12 principles, and a boatload of practices from pages 50 forward explained. So when we talk about project management, we can either run our projects using a simple approach or using a more complex coping mechanism or approach or an anarchy coping approach, which is called agile. Predictive works best down here where the requirements are close to agreement and the technical approach is close to certainty. So we have two axes here and I want you to be aware of these two axes. We have on the Y axis, we have the requirements, and on the x-axis, we have technicality. So page 14 in this book, 
if you take a look, we have requirements uncertainty, and then we have technical degree of uncertainty. And I'm just going to use the R so that you really anchor back this concept of what we call the Stacy complexity model, requirements and technical. And when you are far from certainty, you find yourself in the zone of anarchy, moving from complexity into anarchy. That's a perfect place to use Agile. So Agile works best when there's high variability, need to experiment to discover, and change is likely. Predictive in this simple zone works best when the requirements are well understood. Another key part of PMI's Agile practice guide is the continuum of life cycles. And this just shows you when to use predictive, low degree of change, low frequency of delivery, when to use Agile, high degree of change, high frequency of delivery. To give you more clarity, you've got to take a look at page 18, which breaks down predictive, iterative, incremental, and agile. So if you are in a predictive zone, you're going to deliver one time. And this is a major difference between predictive and agile, single delivery for predictive, frequent small deliveries in the world of agile. Iterative is one that always throws people for a loop because people think it's multiple. It's not. It's a single delivery. So iterative and predictive are actually neighbors. They both have a single delivery. The only difference is that iterative is focused on repeating till correct. So we have a lot of prototyping going on. Incremental, one time per iteration for the activities, but we have frequent smaller deliveries. Now it's easy to get confused with incremental and agile, but there's a major difference. Incremental is one time per iteration. Agile is repeat till correct. So when is it best to use incremental? Best to use incremental when the change is small. The degree of change is low. As you can see on this continuum, we have predictive and incremental having that as a similarity. So predictive has a similarity with incremental in that the change is low. It has a similarity with iterative in that it has a one-time delivery, low frequency of delivery. This is a major thing you need to get from chapter two. Going into chapter three, I'm gonna give you the skinny of chapter three. The skinny of chapter three is that we've got predictive life cycles where things are done linearly. We've got iterative life cycles where we've got feedback loops. We repeat until correct. We've got incremental life cycles. And in these, you can see that we've got varying sizes of increments. We've got two types of agile life cycles to talk about. We've got iteration-based Agile and we've got flow-based Agile. Iteration-based Agile, you can see the cadence has made all of those iterations the same size, but in flow-based Agile, you can see that the sizes are of different lengths, different cadences in that world. Still in chapter three, big thing is understanding that hybridized approaches are now here and we have in this example, Agile development followed by a predictive rollout but you could also have an agile and predictive approach smack dab on top of each other. I call that an agile predictive sub, or you can have a whole lot of agile and a little bit of predictive sprinkled in. We call that a largely agile approach with a predictive component, or you could have a whole lot of predictive and a little bit of agile sprinkled in, and we call that a largely predictive approach with agile components. It just makes sense that now you've got the best of both worlds. You got to juggle them and make them make sense for you as a professional, and that's what you're going to be tested on on some of these exams. Let's talk about implementing Agile. How do you implement Agile? Start with an Agile mindset. Managing a project using an Agile approach requires that the project team adopt an Agile mindset. Remember, Agile is a mindset. Now, you want to think about the order in this way. Purpose first, because where there's no vision, the people are going to perish. We have purpose first. Then we think about the people. The people, once we know the vision, right? So an agile approach emphasizes servant leadership. So you've got to think first about why are we here, why are we doing what we're doing, then the people, we create the team environment, and then we focus on value and outcomes, not process. Servant leadership is big in this chapter. It involves promoting self-awareness, listening, helping people grow, promoting the energy and intelligence of others, relationships management, being an impartial bridge builder, removing bottlenecks, the ability to remove impediments. And on the exam, you'll hear the PMI refer quite a lot to servant leadership or a team lead 
or a project lead, but not necessarily always called a project manager. And the reason is servant leadership is what you should have in the forefront. Okay, what is the role of a project manager in the world of Agile? Someone says, well, I'm a project manager and I have no job. That's not true. It might be somewhat of an unknown, but project managers are different. So they need to move from being at the center to being a servant. It's not just a play on words. Go from being at the center where everyone's saying, that's the PM, that's the boss. No, we want to go from that to being a servant. Let's move on to the next chapter. Next chapter is about implementing Agile, delivering in an Agile environment. The big thing in this world is the charter. No charter, no project. Also in the world of Agile, every project needs a project charter and Agile projects are no exception. They need project charters. Why? So that the vision can be crafted and so that they can be directioned. Now there's also something we call chartering. We need to create a team charter. Teams that have been working together for eons may not need to create a team charter every single project. But where the team has not worked together in that way, a charter could help. There are many things we call a team charter. We call it a social contract. We call it a team contract. We call it a team agreement. You've got to be aware of this. The rest of this chapter talks about events in Agile. So we have retrospectives. The retrospective is the single most important practice as documented by PMI on page 50. We also talk about backlog preparation. How do items get into the backlog? Did aliens drop them off? No, there's gotta be some interface between stakeholders, the product owner, and it ultimately will get put into a backlog. Ultimately, a roadmap will be crafted. Then we talk about backlog refinement. We talk about backlog refinement in that we need to refine our backlog. Our backlog, remember, is a list of all the things that the customer wants, but it doesn't mean that it's all the things the customer is going to get. So in iteration-based Agile, the product owner often works with the team to prepare some stories for the upcoming iteration. So that's a big one to take note of. Still in the guide, we have the daily stand-ups. Daily stand-ups are really for syncing up. They're not for giving status. We call that an anti-pattern. We also hear talk about demos or reviews. It's the role of the product owner to know who to invite to these meetings and to get these meetings flowing sensibly. Also, what makes a project agile is the fact that you are delivering in increments, frequently listening to what the customer says and then getting some new stories, putting those back into the pipeline. And remember, in the world of agile, we do repeat until correct. So whether there is technical debt or whether there are things we discover that are outright defects, those are going to be fixed. We also talk about planning for iteration-based Agile, and that means sprint planning. So in sprint planning, you're going to be aware of capacity, you're going to be aware of story sizing, so on and so forth. That concludes that chapter, my friends. We're on to chapter six. Chapter six is organizational considerations for project agility. The bottom line is this. In the world of Agile, PMOs do exist, but PMOs are not draconian. PMOs invite people to a conversation if there's interest. So every project exists in an organizational context. Cultures, structures, and policies can influence both the direction and the outcome of any project. So it would make sense if you wanted to introduce Agile to a firm for you to actually start with training, coaching at a higher level, begin to use these concepts at a higher level so management can really embrace them and then begin to teach people these practices. And when they embrace them, it's going to be a lot easier for the company to indeed be agile. Here, we also talk about procurements and contracts and there are all sorts of contracts on page 77. I would highly advise knowing those contract types. We have multi-tiered, emphasizing value delivered, fixed price increments, NTE time and materials, graduated time and materials, early cancellation, giving people an off-ramp, dynamic scope option, team augmentation, and favoring full service suppliers. These are things that just make sense to do. Chapter seven is called a call to action. And this is where the PMI says, hey, we want to encourage you to be engaged in the broader communities of project management and agile to further conversations in these topics. And then after this page, we go into a lot of detail 
What makes integration what it is in the world of Agile? It's the team being the integrators. What makes scope what it is? We spend less time trying to define an agree on scope in the early stage of the project. Instead, we want a process for its ongoing discovery. We do lightweight scheduling, lightweight costing. Quality is all about having those regular retrospectives, regular checks on the effectiveness. Resource management in this world, we don't call people resources in the world of Agile. That's a big no-no, but projects with high variability benefit from team structures that have collaboration, flexibility, and T-shaped skills. Communications, we've got to communicate quick, so we use information radiators. We use osmotic communication. Risk is not negated in Agile. Believe it or not, a lot of teams use risk registers. But you got to remember that there's a difference between a risk and an impediment. A risk is an impediment waiting to happen. So we want to catch these before they become impediments. In the world of procurement, we do MSAs, master services agreements. We're not just tunnel visioned into a fixed, fixed, fix, but we want flexible arrangements. Stakeholder management, remember business people and developers, they got to work together daily throughout the project. I close with this. Again, remember you've got these tables that show you how the manifesto values and principles are painted throughout the chapters. And don't forget, we have a boatload of other agile frameworks talked about. Everything from Scrum to Kanban. And I'm going to just touch on one, which is scaling. Talk about a Scrum of Scrums. We can see that a Scrum of Scrums just takes one member from each group and scales that up so that at higher levels, we can have less people meeting, free people up to do work and coordinate at those higher levels. And that, my friends, is the end of our Agile Practice Guide Summary. I hope you found it to be useful and I hope it equips you and catapults you into excellence for either exam you're taking, ACP, PMP, CAPM, or whatever exam you may be focused on. Thank you very much. I wish you all the very best. Let me know if you've got any questions. Bye Scrum for in now. three minutes. Think about stakeholders, customers. They've got something that they want, but in order to articulate it, they need the product owner. The product owner knows what the business wants, what the customers want. It gets put into a product backlog. Then we move into the sprint. The first event in the sprint is known as sprint planning. Meet the rest of the team. Here we have the scrum master who is like a coach for the team, a servant leader who coaches a team into excellence in scrum. And then we have the developers. The developers are those individuals who get the work done in this world. Now, in sprint planning, our goal is to come out with a sprint backlog. The sprint backlog has a goal. It has the items that we're going to work on in the sprint. The sprint is a time box. A time box in this world of Scrum, anywhere from one to four weeks. The team gets work done in this time box. So everything that's selected in the sprint backlog should fit within the time box. The next event is called a daily Scrum. This is where the team answers three questions. What have I done yesterday to move us towards a sprint goal? What am I going to do today to move us towards a sprint goal? Are there any impediments in my way? Are there any accelerators that the team needs to know about? Here they are. We'll talk about them after the meeting, in a different meeting if needed. The next thing that happens, it's an optional one. It's called backlog refinement. This is where the product owner works with the team to get some requests or user stories, if they are in that form, ready for the next sprint. They could be in any format that works for you. The next thing that happens is we get the increment, also known as a potentially shippable increment. This means we could ship this if it is featured enough, but not every increment is featured enough. So we may need to have a number of increments to get a release. Also bear in mind, it doesn't have to be just one increment we get in a sprint. We could have several increments. The next event that happens is known as a sprint review. This is where the customers, the stakeholders give us feedback as far as what we have created. From this great feedback, we know what to do in subsequent sprints. The next event is a sprint retrospective. This is where we look at what went well, what didn't go so well, what can we improve on right now, and what can we improve on perhaps even in the next sprint. We put these into the backlog. You want to have a mindset of getting improvements done as quickly as possible. 
You can see we have three roles, product owner, scrum master, and developers, five ceremonies that are officially recognized. That is sprint planning, the sprint, sprint review, sprint retrospective, and daily scrum. And we have three artifacts, product backlog, sprint backlog, and increment. I hope you found this to be helpful. Hit like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon so you'll be notified whenever I come online with more videos. Thanks for joining me. Bye for now. Hello, fellow project managers, business professionals. I hope you're doing well. Today, we're going to be talking about Agile. We're going to be talking about what it is and what it is not. So let's start off by addressing what Agile is. In a few words, you could say that Agile is a mindset. It's a state of mind. And the word mindset in this sense means an ever evolving, ever changing, ever adaptable state of mind. I would call it more a state of mind at any point in time that enables you to pivot in response to the ever changing world around us. That's what Agile is. It is not a framework. It is not a methodology, as many people wrongly say. In fact, I was querying these AI tools, ChatGPT and Bard, about Agile. And what I got back was it's a framework or it's a methodology. And I said, uh, no, you got it wrong. It's not. Agile is a state of mind that is ever fluid, ever ready to be adaptive and malleable to the ever-changing world around. The world never stays stagnant. This field that I'm sitting in, it wasn't like this 50 years ago. It wasn't like this 100 years ago. But it evolves, the world changes. And in order for you to be the best version of yourself from a humanistic point of view, you gotta be able to adapt. You gotta be able to keep up with the times and you gotta be able to mold your ideas in response to the ever-changing world around you. An example that I give very readily would be the likes of AI, right? The whole AI movement. That's a great example of adaptability. When people don't adapt, they resist change. You know, the same way people resisted the internet when it came out, or the same way people resisted TV and radio when it came out, the same way people are resisting AI. And that's not being agile. Being agile means you are able to respond to whatever change is, be it technology change, social change, economic change. And I'm talking about change that is for the better. It's moving forward, move with the time. Now, this whole idea about agile, it's been around for a while. It didn't start off in the 2000s. It's been a while, around for a while, back in the... 80s, people were already talking about things like this. But it came to a head in 2001 when 17 people who had been used to doing things in a rather straight, linear fashion decided to explore ways of doing things differently. And this is what spurred what we know today as the Agile movement, if you will. The Agile movement was very well set on philosophies. You could call them values and principles that were established by what I would call a group of pioneers. And we're talking about 17 individuals who said, there's a better way, there's a better mousetrap of developing products. There's a better mousetrap for developing and working together. And that 
is the Agile Manifesto. So let's talk about the Agile Manifesto. It's a set of values and principles. And there are four values and 12 principles that I want to address. So let's address them one by one. The first value, it just states, we're uncovering better ways of developing products by doing it and helping others do it. And through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. So what does that mean? It means that as a business professional, as a team player, as a team member, when you look at the world around you and the people around you, value the individuals and how they interact over the processes and the tools. It's not saying processes and tools are not good because processes and tools establish a framework for us to do a lot of stuff. But being agile is all about valuing the people and how they interact over the processes and tools. Why is that? It's because people, they'll surprise you. You could have all the processes and tools in the world, but if people are not working together and collaborating and optimizing by synergizing, then those processes and tools aren't going to do very much for them. So we need to value people and their interactions over processes and tools. Another way of looking at it is like this. As an earthling, if someone from Mars, <laughs> assuming there could be, right? If someone from Mars appeared on planet Earth and asked you questions about planet Earth, you could say, through my being on planet Earth, I've come to value water over food because I know I'll survive longer if I have water than if I just had food. You get what I'm saying? That's not to say food is invaluable. It's just that you value water more for obvious reasons. So I want you, when you see over, I don't want you to think it's saying instead of. We're not saying water instead of food. No, we're saying individuals and interactions are valued, should be valued over the processes and tools. The next one says working product over comprehensive documentation. What are we saying here? We're saying that you should value a working product because without the product working, the manual does nothing for you. The manual is worthless. I give an example of how when I got a gift for Father's Day, which was a back massager, and I got all excited and I plugged in the back massager, but the back massager didn't come on. The back massager stayed off even though I had a big old manual. So I couldn't use, unfortunately, my back massager, neither could I use the manual. You see, working product is valued over comprehensive documentation. Because I had a working product, I would have been able to use the manual, but because I didn't have a working product, I couldn't. So the idea, my friend, is to value a working product and to drive to getting that product working over big old documentation, a stack of papers that tell you how to use a product that isn't working. You get what I'm saying? It's common sense. The next one is simply customer collaboration over contract negotiation. So what are we saying here? We're saying that it's better to have a mindset of collaboration with a customer than being so rigidly focused on contracts and this is what the contract says, so that's all we're doing, that's all we're giving. It's better to, in your mind, have a more collaborative response, a more collaborative ideology, as opposed to you just blindly looking at contracts and dollars and things like that. It's better for you to have more of a mindset to work with the customer, to help the customer as a servant, as it were, a leader, than for you to be so blinded to, oh, I have to go by the contract. This is what the contract says, and we can't do anything more than this. 
I always give this example of going to a Starbucks for my coffee and I've gone there, let's say for the past 10 years. And on this occasion, maybe there's a slip of tongue and I get it wrong. And I say, I want a three instead of a one. And they refuse to work with you. And they say, no, you said it's a three you wanted and that's what you got. How rude would that be? <laughs> but in the same token, how rude is it when in the world of business, we don't allow the customer to work with us because we don't want to work with them. You get what I'm saying? So when we talk about customer collaboration, work with a customer, you want to have branded on your t-shirt, team customer. That's the mindset. All right. The next one simply says responding to change over following a plan. And for this, I want to refer you to Mike Tyson, the great Mike Tyson, whether people like it or not, is quite an interesting character. And he said, everyone has a plan until they're punched in the mouth. Think about it. You have a plan, you're in the ring and bam, someone sucks you in the jaw and you're on the canvas looking up. Think about that. You had a plan, but now where's your little plan? Your little plan can't save you. It's the same way in business. If you're not able to respond to change, you could be sucked in the jaw. A lot of people responding to change in bad ways, saying, we're not going to do it. We're going to ignore that. Or that's not going to be around for long. Things are going to go back to normal. Uh, no. History has taught us many lessons. The like of Blockbuster, right? The likes of Blockbuster, the likes of Toys R Us. You know, I used to like Toys R Us, but they were not able to respond to the crazy e-commerce world. Amazon took them down, even, even though they were, Amazon was meant to be working with Toys R Us, but inadvertently or not, Amazon took Amazon took a bunch of people down. Those people that were not able to respond to change took them down. The whole toy industry had to bow down because e-commerce, you know, people, they just want to shop at home these days. Even the biggest chains, they respect Amazon because they know Amazon is a big kahuna and they had to mimic, they had to copy, right? Or they had to get on the bandwagon of, of e-commerce. Look at the likes of TM Lewin, one of my favorite stores. They're not completely gone because someone bought the assets, but as a result of the crazy pandemic and them not being able to respond accordingly because they just had brick and mortar stores all around and people unable to go into those stores during the pandemic, it, it crushed them. But those who were savvy and had already built an e-commerce pipeline, they, they were able to survive. You know, or you look at the likes of Netflix who have dominated the space. And, you know, it's, it's funny because when Netflix began to absolutely kill it, the likes of HBO and Hulu and, you know, Peacock, all of them began getting on the bandwagon because they realized, oh, this is the way forward. And that's the way to do it. That's the way to do it. you got to respond to change around you. I give it to Samsung. People... <laughs> People criticize Samsung, but hey, they got a piece of the pie. They didn't respond late. They weren't tardy to the party. Even though Apple was in the space, they jumped on the bandwagon and they started killing it. They start you know, releasing phone versions quicker than App Apple would ever because, you know, Apple, they're the design freaks, right? So whatever passes the Apple table, it, it has, it's so rigorous. And I, I give Apple full commendation for that but samsung they were wild they were beastly they responded and of course their, their wrist got slapped a few billions perhaps but they got a piece of the pie because they responded they saw that the way forward was smartphones uh, how many people use flip phones go find out also the likes of kodak right kodak they've been around since like forever you know but when the tide changed and people went from instant photos with these big old manual cameras to phones, Kodak was behind. They were behind. They weren't able to catch up. Talk about bankruptcy, huh? And the tide changes. And all I'm saying is, in order to be agile, you must respond to the ever-changing world around you. You see, this is not about software. It's not about IT. 
a lot of people, they hear about Agile and they begin to immediately shut us down, saying, oh, that's, that's just for IT, that's just software. Uh, no, no. Agile is not just about software. Agile is about a mindset, a response to change around you. It doesn't have to be software, even though it started there. It's funny because software, they've borrowed a lot from construction, right? From the world of operations and product, right? The Toyota factory and lean, yes. That's the origins of Agile. But we're getting it back. We engineers and construction people and product people and operations people, we're all jumping in to enjoy the benefits of Agile thinking, and we're doing it. And we're helping others do it. And through this work, we are coming to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools, working product over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. I hope you enjoyed this episode, my friends, of going through the Agile values. In my next video, I'm going to be working with you on understanding the Agile principles. And there are 12 principles. If you want to stick around a little bit more, you'll be able to watch this straight away. So I'll be going into the values uh, and the, going into the principles after the values. And I hope you stick around. If you're unable to stick around, I'll see you in the next video. All right. For those of you who can stick around, let's move on and talk about the principles. To get to the principles, just scroll down on the Agile Manifesto.org page and click on the principles page, if it lets you. It doesn't seem to be letting me. There seems to be something going on. So I have to uh, get this set up to allow me to uh, share. So let me try that again. See if it will let me. I don't think it's going to let me. I thought I could. But if you stick around, we'll talk about the principles, all right? So just stick around. I'm going to talk about the principles. All right. So regarding the values, the values are more like overarching pillars that frame your thinking, that frame your direction of thought. But the principles, I refer to the principles as beacons of behavior. These are things that help frame how we actually behave. Because as a man thinker, so is he. So if you're thinking in a particular direction and your practices are guided by certain principles, well, you know for sure if you are truly being agile or not. There's a difference between being agile and doing agile. Some people say, oh, we're doing agile. We're implementing agile. No, you can't implement a mindset, my friends. You can implement frameworks and stuff, but when it comes to this whole world of agile, you gotta be honest. It's not something you can replicate and press a magic red button and bing, everybody's now agile. <laughs> That's not how it works. It's a mindset. You gotta you gotta let the, the principles seep into you. And then when you are behaving, whichever way you are, you're able to gauge, oh, that was very unagile. Or that was very agile. So let's dive into the principles now. Okay. The first principle, it says we follow these principles. Our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable product. I always replace the word software with product because I want to respect all those who are not in the software space but espouse the agile principles, that espouse the agile dogma. Okay? So when we say our highest priority, we mean it. That's why it's principle number one. If you are doggedly focused 
on satisfying your customer by delivering products and value and benefits early, you're in the right direction. This is where Agile differs from predictive a little bit. In predictive, our major focus is not to deliver early and continuously. It's to deliver one time. But in the world of Agile, we want to deliver whatever we're delivering in tiny little chunks and increments as quickly as possible so that our customer can begin to reap the benefits, the harvest of us giving whatever value we are in tiny increments, in small increments. So our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. How? Through early and continuous delivery of valuable products. The key word being valuable, it's not just throwing anything at the customer and saying, there you go, there you go. No, it has to be valuable. Number two, welcome changing requirements, even late in development. Think about that. A lot of times when we get requests late in development, there's a tendency to complain and say, these customers, I can't believe they're asking for this at the 99th hour. But if only we had a change in mind, a change in heart to think about the fact that we wouldn't actually have a contract. Some of us wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for the customer. So when we think about the place of the customer, if they're asking for stuff late in development, we should actually say, this is for my customer's competitive business advantage. Why am I complaining? Why are we complaining? Let's do it. All right. So that makes sense. Number three, deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to show the time scale. So in the world of Agile, one of the things we try to do is deliver frequently. And if we're delivering frequently, it means we're delivering in shorter iterations, shorter time bursts. And a predictive project could go on for a year, six months before seeing anything, even three months is long. But in an agile project, a lot of agile teams, they get stuff done four weeks or less. Some teams get stuff done in days and they're handing it off. Talk about the likes of Amazon and the whole AWS thing. They're delivering a lot frequently than just uh, weeks. They could be delivering in hours. They could be delivering in minutes. You think about Spotify, Spotify is always delivering on the regular. So when you think about the world of Agile, it's different from predictive in that we are delivering frequently and the time span is a lot quicker and we're doing it in short bursts and iterations and we are repeating over and over again. All right, next one says, business people and developers must work together daily throughout the project. If you're doing things in smaller increments, then there has to be daily frequent communication frequent collaboration. I remember training an architectural firm and one of the persons there on the call said, really daily? I don't like working with the sales team daily. They get on my nerves. I said, uh, that isn't really agile. <laughs> that is not an agile thought. Uh, let's find how we can enjoy working together. But beyond that, the reason why we work together daily in agile is we have different roles in some of these frameworks. And in one of the frameworks, there's a role that's from the business called a product owner. And the product owner is just one of the team working with the developer and working with the coach who we call the scrum master, the coach who coaches the team to be able to get things done expediently and efficiently. And we work together daily. And that's the idea. We're working as a team. We're together. We're team customer. We're all one. That's the idea. All right, let's move on. Build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. How would you like to work with a demotivated team? Build a project around a demotivated team. Oh, I hate coming into work. Oh, that fly did show up for work. <laughs> I hate coming into work. I cannot stand the surroundings I'm in. No, that's not good. We want to build our projects around a team that enjoys coming into work, a team that is enjoying the environment that they're in because we give them the environment and support they need. We trust them to get the job done and we're not babysitting them. We're not bubble wrapping them. They're allowed to make mistakes. They correct. They get on the paddy wagon and they do better. And, and that's, that's the general idea. The next one says the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. 
this is not rocket science. It's been proven over and over again, and the likes of Professor Emeritus Abba Morabian, they've done research, and part of his research was about communicating a heartfelt, empathetic message, high-stakes kind of message. When you're communicating those kind of messages, the body language, the tone of voice is huge. It's really accentuated in that in his experiments, he found a 55387 configuration. 55% of the communication was perceived or came across strongly by the body language. 38% through the tone of voice and only 7% of the message was perceived through the words. And you can go read up the experiment, Professor Emeritus Albert Moravian, and it's truly remarkable research. We're not saying every communication follows this cookie cutter, but we're saying as a rule of thumb, action speaks louder than words. I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I think you I think you did a good job. That doesn't speak the language because the body language is off. There needs to be congruence, right? Between what you say, how you say it, and your stance, right? Your body language. So the 55387, it holds true. And that's why we say when you have an opportunity of communicating, face to face is the best. There's some things you communicate as a team, or fireflies have come out to play. There's some things that you communicate within a team, and it just goes better when it's face to face. Empathy is felt, understanding is felt, sincerity is felt, and sometimes it even has nothing to do with that. It's about tacit knowledge and explicit knowledge. It's about being in that same location, the proximity. It just helps convey whatever message it is, whatever the communication is. So that's all we're saying here. All right, let's move on. Next one says, working product is a primary measure of progress. So when we do things in the world of Agile, we endeavor to do things in short bursts. And for that reason, our primary measure of progress is not some... Gantt chart. It's not a Gantt chart. It's not um, some big old histogram. Um, our primary measure of progress is a working product in the world of Agile. So if you're done, you're done. We give you a two-week window, three-week, four-week, whatever that window is. It's short. But the summary is you either have a working product at the end of the two-week window or whatever the window is, or you don't. If you do have something, hooray, great. That's progress. If you don't, well, the primary measure of progress says uh, you got ways to go. All right, so that's how you need to think about it. The next one says agile processes promote sustainable development. The sponsors, developers, and users should be able to maintain a constant pace. These flies are maintaining a constant pace, maintain a constant pace indefinitely. So what this is telling you is don't kill the team. I call it the don't kill the team principle. What it's saying is work at a pace that you know you can sustain for the long haul. If you are working ADL weeks, you're living in la-la land because you, that is not sustainable. Someone says, no, it's sustainable for me. Well, pfft, whatever's sustainable for you, my friend. But in reality, don't do what is going to kill the team, what is going to burn them out. Someone says, well, just do a bunch of overtime. Well, overtime isn't our friend. It's not our best friend in this world of Agile for a number of reasons. First of all, overtime is not repeatable. So it messes with your metrics and whatever empirical measurements you want to glean. It's not sustainable. So as much as possible, we want reality for the sake of empiricism and because we don't want to kill the team. All right. So that's what we're saying there. Let's move to the next one. Continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. Agility originates from the idea of being lean. You want to do the minimum to get the maximum. So when you pay attention to technical excellence and good design, it prevents waste. I'm not saying it avoids waste, but it definitely prevents a whole lot of fan clean, a whole lot of waste. And that's why you should be technically excellent. Don't do a shoddy job. Don't do shoddy work. We don't want technical debt, which is, you know, owing things to be done the right way because we cut corners. The fan is still spinning, but under the fan, we've got a mass of wires and cables that are all over the place. To service that thing is going to be hard. 
Well, that's not agile and that's not technical excellence. Technical excellence is following the design principles, getting it right, have solid design. You know, the, the great Steve Jobs, he said design is not just what it looks like, or what it feels like, design is how it works. You know, so in order to get a good product, spend time in great design. All right, the next one says, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. What is it saying? It is saying, maximize the amount of fat you cut out. Cut out the fat. In a lot of processes today, if we look under the hood, we find things that are not even worth doing. Things that we shouldn't even be really focusing on. And those things that we see that are fat, we need to cut it out and we need to maximize the amount of fat that we cut out. So maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. All right, it's coming down to the wire here, my friend. We've got two left. This says the best architectures, requirements, and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. It's been proven when you give the team the environment and support they need, trust them to get the job done, let them figure it out, they get the best results. The final one here just says at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective than tunes and adjust its behavior accordingly. What we're saying here is that the idea of a retrospective is a good idea. Retrospectives are a, uh, you could call them an event in Agile where the team looks in the rear view mirror at what went well, what didn't go so well, what could we do better? What did we do that we want to repeat? And it's a reflection, it's them reflecting on what happened and making sure that things go well, uh, beyond the point they're in. You could call it Kaizen. So there you have it, my friends. We took a look at the four values and the 12 principles of Agile. And I hope you enjoyed it. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, share with your friends. And you'll meet me again. That's for sure. I'll be back talking about Agile some more. All right. You take care. Remember, go on down to agilemanifesto.org. And uh, you can actually download a version of this. I'll endeavor to put a link below. You take care. And bye for now. Hello and welcome to seven things to know about Kanban. Number one, Kanban is less prescriptive than other agile approaches. It is also less disruptive. Project teams can begin applying the Kanban method with relative ease and progress towards other agile approaches if needed. It's incredibly flexible. If you wanted to start Kanban, you could start right away. How is Kanban practiced? Kanban is centered around the Kanban board, which we will be learning about. Here's a simple version of a Kanban board. It has items that we plan to do, items that we are currently doing, and items that are done. I use a Kanban board for my personal work. I use a Kanban board to write 12 books. The Kanban board gives you a visual reminder of what needs to be done, and it encourages you to move along. Number two, Kanban is a Japanese term. It's derived from roots that translate to visual board. Kanban's focus is to optimize the throughput of work by visualizing the flow of work through the process, limiting work in progress, and explicitly identifying policies for the flow of work. Kanban has distinct differences from other popular agile methodologies, primarily the fact that it's not based on time box iterations like Scrum, but rather allows for continuous prioritization and delivery of work. Number three, Kanban is from Toyota. It's derived from Toyota's lean production system. As I said, it's a Japanese word and Kanban focuses on limiting whip. You often hear that term quite a lot, limit your whip. What do we mean by limit your whip? Well, in order for work to flow effectively through the process, we must limit our work in progress. This is founded predominantly on a law known as Little's Law. Little's Law states that the long term average number of customers in a stable system. L is equal to the long-term average effective arrival rate, 
lambda multiplied by the average time a customer spends in the system, W. L, average number of items, WIP, lambda, the average number of items arriving at the system per unit of time, we call that throughput, and W is the average waiting time an item spends in a queuing system, lead time. The formula is WIP equals throughput times lead time, or WIP divided by throughput equals lead time. Therefore, if you want to increase throughput, limit WIP, speed up the process, reduce lead time. If that's what you want to do, then limit WIP. There is a 30 plus minute video on YouTube where I explain Little's Law. I advise you to look into it. But let's take a look at a bare bones example. John owns a small coffee shop. He wants to know the average number of customers queuing in his coffee shop to decide whether he needs to add more space to accommodate more customers. Currently, his queuing area can accommodate no more than eight people. John has measured that on average, 40 customers arrive his coffee shop every hour. He's also determined that on average, a customer spends around six minutes in his store or 0.1 hours. What is the average number of customers queuing in his coffee shop? Given these inputs, John can find the average number of customers queuing in his coffee shop by applying little slow. Throughput equals whip divided by lead time, or we could say lambda equals L divided by W. So L is a number in the queuing system. That's equal to lead time times throughput. So if we apply the formula, we have the average number of items WIP in the queuing system is equal to 40, which is your throughput times your lead time of 0 0.1. And that gives us four customers. Now, this is not needed for your exam if you're preparing for the PMP exam or even the ACP exam. But if you wanted to know a little bit more, go watch my 30 minute video where I cover this in great detail. The summary is in order to maximize your output limit your whip. Moving on to number four, Kanban has defining principles. These are talked about on page 104 in the Agile Practice Guide. Start with the current state. Two, agree to pursue incremental evolutionary change. Three, respect the current process, roles, responsibilities, and titles. And four, encourage acts of leadership at all levels. Number five, Kanban has core properties. Visualize the workflow and limit your work in progress. Manage the flow. Make process policies explicit. Implement feedback loops and improve collaboratively. Moving on to number six. The Kanban board is a fixture in many Agile frameworks. As you can see in this Kanban board, states have been further split into doing and done. There are many different types of Kanban boards, but unlike a task board, the Kanban board is not reset at the beginning of each iteration. Its columns represent the different processing states of a unit of value, which is generally, but not necessarily, equated with a user story. Each column may have associated with it a work in progress limit. And the work in progress limit are those numbers at the top, three, five, three. Those are our limits. The priority is to clear current work in progress and team members will swarm to help those working on the item blocking the flow of the work. You might hear the term Kanban method we could define this as an approach to continuous improvement that relies on visualizing the current system of work, scheduling, managing flow as the primary measure of performance. 
and whole system optimization. As a process improvement approach, it does not prescribe any particular practices. Agile teams employing a Kanban method may de-emphasize the use of iterations, effort estimates, and velocity as a primary measure of progress, rely on measures of lead time or cycle time instead of velocity, and replace the task board with a Kanban board. Kanban seeks to alleviate the bottlenecks in waterfall development by limiting WIP, by limiting in-progress work in order to efficiently and effectively design and deliver products to customers. Limiting WIP prevents a team from committing to too much. Since new work should not be started until the current work has been completed, bottlenecks blocking the completion of work should become more visible in the process. There's a term that we often use to describe what we do in our heads. We stop starting and we start finishing. This framework focuses on the flow of work and was inspired by lean manufacturing. Kanban is still used in manufacturing as well as other applications. And this section focuses on Kanban for software development. This is from the GAO Agile Guide. I highly recommend Googling GAO Agile, and you can find the long document where a lot of this presentation is from. Last but not least, there are no described roles in Kanban, which comes as a surprise to many people because we're used to seeing configurations like 353, three roles, five ceremonies, three artifacts in the world of Scrum, and other frameworks have similar roles, but in this, there are no prescribed roles. This allows for maximum team flexibility so that members can work on each other's artifacts easily. Teams use a Kanban board to keep track of their work, which can be either physical or virtual. A Kanban board maintains a clear visual representation of the work through various stages of development. An example of a typical Kanban board is again shown here. This is from the GAO Agile Guide. Highly recommend you reading up. So in summary, visualize what you do today, limit the amount of work in progress, and focus on flow, backlog prioritization. These Kanban principles are intended to be responsive to change that often occurs during a demonstration. Having a short cycle time helps ensure that customers provide feedback to the team on a regular basis, resulting in delivery of desired software features faster than traditional methods. In addition, Kanban promotes having user stories that are all similar in size in order to limit in-process work so that it is both manageable and predictable. Thank you very much for joining me today. I wish you all the very best. Don't forget to hit like, subscribe, share with your friends. All the best. Bye for now. Fellow project managers, you probably already know by now that the PMP exam is heavily agile these days. For that reason, not only do you need to know the terms in the Agile Practice Guide, you also need to know the wider body of agile terms that float around out there. Concepts and terms that are not necessarily in the Agile Practice Guide, but are definitely possibilities on the exam. So why don't we jump into over a hundred terms from the world of Agile to equip you to better function on your PMP exam. Are you ready? Let's go. This is gonna be a very quick run through. Number one, out of order, I have the term agile. Why? Because of course we're talking about agile. Agile is something you are, not something you do. If you take nothing else away from this particular slide, I would like you to take away that agile is a mindset. It's not a checklist. It's not the methodology. It's not a set of rituals that we practice like blind bats in an alley, just doing what we have been instructed to do. No, no, no. This is where we actually know why we are doing what we are doing, how we are doing it. In agile, we fail forward. We make mistakes, we learn, we gather data, empirical data is used in iterative planning. And that's 
what Agile is in an organic way. Let's go to our Agile practice guide. The PMI term this as a term used to describe a mindset of values and principles as set forth in the Agile manifesto. Let's go to our next term, acceptance test driven development. And simply put, according to the PMI, it's a method of collaboratively creating acceptance test criteria that are used to create acceptance tests before delivery begins. Now we can expand that out and include other definitions of ATDD. Acceptance test-driven development involves team members with different perspectives, customer development testing, collaborating to write acceptance tests in advance of implementing the corresponding functionality. When we talk about ATDD, the entire team gets together, they discuss the acceptance criteria for a work product, and then the team creates the tests, which allows the team to write just enough code and automated tests to meet the criteria. For non-software projects, consider how to test the work as the team completes chunks of value. The next term here in the Agile Practice Guide is Agile Coach. This is someone who has knowledge and experience in Agile who can train, mentor, guide organizations through their transformation. The next term is Agile Lifecycle. It's an approach that is both iterative and incremental to refine work items and deliver frequently. The next term is the Agile Manifesto. This is the original and official definition of Agile values and the 12 principles. Agile mindset, it's a way of thinking and behaving. The Agile mindset embodies a focus on customers, teams, and those operating within that network. Agile practitioner, someone who practices Agile in mind and who collaborates with like-minded colleagues. Agile principles, the 12 principles of the Agile Manifesto. Now it will be wrong for us not to cover this, so let's do it rapidly. Number one, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. Number two, I'm going to truncate them. Welcome changing requirements, even late in development. Three, deliver working software frequently. Four, business people and developers must work together daily. Five, build projects around motivated individuals. Give them the environment and support they need and trust them to get the job done. Six, the most efficient and effective method of conveying information to and within a development team is face-to-face -face conversation. Seven, working software is the primary measure of progress. Eight, agile processes promote sustainable development. Note the word constant pace indefinitely. Nine, continuous attention to technical excellence and good design enhances agility. 10, simplicity, the art of maximizing the amount of work not done is essential. 11, the best architectures, requirements and designs emerge from self-organizing teams. And 12, at regular intervals, the team reflects on how to become more effective then tunes and adjusts its behavior accordingly. Next is AUP, the Agile Unified Process. This is an offshoot of the Unified Process for software projects. It features more accelerated styles and less heavyweight processes than its Unified Process predecessor. The intent is to perform more iterative cycles across seven key disciplines and also to incorporate the associated feedback before formal delivery. The next term is Agilist. An Agilist is someone who is a practitioner of Agile. The next term is Anti-Pattern. An Anti-Pattern is a flawed work pattern that is unadvisable. It's a deviation from the norm to a modified but unfavorable, unproductive pattern. Anti-Patterns are common solutions to common problems where the solution is ineffective and may result in undesired consequences. The next term here is automated code 
quality analysis. This is scripted testing of the code for bugs and other defective code items. The next term is backlog. This typically refers to a product backlog, but in cases where you're working on a service or something else, you may call it a backlog to make it as agnostic as possible. Not necessarily Scrum and could be fit into a Kanban discussion. So a backlog, typically a product backlog, is a list of the new features, changes to existing features, bug fixes, infrastructure changes, or other activities that a team may deliver in order to achieve a specific outcome. The product backlog is the single authoritative source for things that a team works on. That means nothing gets done that isn't on the product backlog. The PMI lists this as an ordered list of user-centric requirements that a team maintains for a product. Let's move on to our next one, backlog refinement. Backlog refinement is an ongoing team activity of collaboratively updating the product backlog via reprioritization, adding, deleting, rewriting stories, splitting, and estimating. This practice ensures the backlog is always actionable. Let's read what the PMI say about it. The progressive elaboration of project requirements and or the ongoing activity in which the team collaboratively reviews, updates, and rewrites requirements to satisfy the need of the customer request. Let's talk about BDD, Behavior Driven Development. Simply put by the PMI, it's a system and validation practice that uses test first principles and English like scripts. Now, before we talk about English-like scripts, let's break down BDD a little bit more. It's a synthesis and refinement of practices stemming from TDD and ATDD. BDD augments TDD and ATDD with the following tactics. Apply the five whys principle to each proposed user story so that its purpose is clearly related to business outcomes thinking from the outside in, in other words, implement only those behaviors which contribute most directly to these business outcomes so as to minimize waste. Describe behaviors in a single notation which is directly accessible to domain experts, testers, and developers so as to improve communication and apply these techniques all the way down to the lowest level of abstraction of the software. And a huge shout out to our friends at the Agile Alliance. They never fail to give us great descriptions. And of course, that's why the PMI partnered with them to write the Agile Practice Guide. Blended Agile. Blended Agile is when you blend two or more Agile frameworks. For example, XP and Kanban. Blocker. A blocker can also be thought of as an impediment. An impediment is something that impedes the team's progress. Reading from the Agile Practice Guide definition, it's an obstacle that prevents the team from reaching its objectives, also known as a blocker. Broken comb. Broken comb refers to a person with various depths of specialization in multiple skills required by the team also known as paint drip. In the paint drip effect, when you are brushing your paintbrush across the wall, many instances, one singular row of paint goes all the way down. And that represents a skill that is going all the way down in a lot of depth. But then you have other rows of paint that may not go all the way down and might be truncated. And you have some that go towards the middle and some that stay right at the top. That's just like a broken comb, also known as paint drip, showing that you could have broad scales, but not every single one of those is deep, also known as the paint drip. Burn down chart. The PMI defined this as a graphical representation of the work remaining 
versus the time left in a time box. When you look at the burn down chart, you're seeing the work remaining. Burn up chart is the next one. And the difference is it's a graphical representation of the work completed towards the release of a product, but you are seeing the work as you are getting it done. It is comforting to many teams to see work being accomplished rather than work remaining, which could be demoralizing. But we should look at both, shouldn't we? Next, we have business requirements documents, BRD. And this is listing of all requirements for a specific project. The next one the PMI have here is cadence, a rhythm of execution. Next, we have collective code ownership, a project acceleration and collaboration technique whereby any member is authorized to modify project work, a product or deliverable, thus emphasizing team-wide ownership and accountability. Continuous delivery, the practice of delivering feature increments immediately to customers, often through the use of small batches of work and automation technology. Continuous integration, a practice in which each team member's work products are frequently integrated and validated with one another. Cross-functional team, a team that includes practitioners with all the skills necessary to deliver valuable product increments. Crystal family of methodologies, a shout out to our friend Al, creator of Crystal, it's a collection of lightweight, agile software development methods focused on adaptability to a particular circumstance. And while it's not used widely today, it has a lot of useful elements that companies still pick and place into other frameworks. Daily Scrum. When you hear daily scrum, you're thinking of a daily standup. The team meets daily for short meetings, which are typically held standing up face to face to encourage brief sessions. This is not a status meeting and we definitely don't want to get into that anti pattern of it becoming a status meeting. So we only invite those team members. The team the scrum team, that's who you want in attendance. Don't invite management except you absolutely have to, except they're curious. This meeting is for people to ask quick questions that will allow them get the information they need or remove blockers. Long answers and discussions should have follow-ups after the meeting in smaller groups. The PMI defines this daily scrum as a brief daily collaboration in which the team reviews progress from the previous day, declares intentions for the current day and highlights any obstacles. The key question is, what have you accomplished since the last meeting to move us forward towards a sprint goal? What are you gonna do between now and the next meeting to move us closer to the sprint goal? Uh, which impediments are blocking your way? Definition of done, a team's checklist of all the criteria required to be met so that a deliverable can be considered ready for customer use. Definition of ready, a team's checklist for a user-centric requirement that has all the information the team needs to be able to begin working on it. DevOps a collection of practices for creating a smooth flow of delivery by improving collaboration between development and operation staff, hence the term DevOps. Discipline Agile, a process decision framework that enables simplified process decisions around incremental and iterative solution delivery. Double loop learning, a process that challenges underlying values and assumptions in order to better elaborate root causes and devise improved countermeasures rather than focusing only on symptoms. DSDM, it's 
an agile project delivery framework. You don't hear too much of it, but it's a relevant one to look out for. English-like scripts. It means a programming language with a simple English-like syntax. Python, for example, is one of such languages and the script sounds almost like simple English when read. Epic. An epic is a large user story. Bear in mind the last two definitions are not in the Agile Practice Guide. Equivalent to Scrum Master. What do we mean by this? Equivalent to Scrum Master could mean someone who is a servant leader, but is not necessarily labeled as a Scrum Master. When we say someone is equivalent to the Scrum Master, bear in mind that in the world of Agile, there are many frameworks and methods, but Scrum is the only one that we use the label Scrum Master. So the equivalent of Scrum Master in that framework or method is what this refers to. Evolutionary Value Delivery, EVO. This is an agile approach allowing teams to deliver more business value in less time as has been shown in numerous environments like projects for space, 40 year, 40 man years saved, which is huge, building automation and banking in waterfall projects, scientific research, as well as agile and scrum teams. The PMI simply defines this as openly credited as the first agile method that contains a specific component no other methods have. The focus on delivering multiple measurable value requirements to stakeholders. The next one is Extreme Programming, known as XP. It's an agile software development framework that aims to produce higher quality software and higher quality of life for the development team. XP is the most specific of the agile frameworks regarding appropriate engineering practices for software development. Simply described in the Agile Practice Guide, an agile software development method that leads to higher quality software, a greater responsiveness to changing customer requirements, and more frequent releases in shorter cycles. Feature-Driven Development, FDD. It's a lightweight agile software development method driven from the perspective of features valued by clients. Fit for purpose, a product that is suitable for its intended purpose. Fit for use, a product that is usable in its current form to achieve its intended purpose. Flow master, the coach for a team and service request manager working in a continuous flow or Kanban context, equivalent to scrum master. We covered that. Framework, a basic system or structure of ideas or facts that support an approach. Functional requirement, a specific behavior that a product or service should perform. Functional specification, a specific function that a system or application is required to perform. Hoshin Canry, this is policy management. It's a seven step process used in strategic planning in which strategic goals are communicated throughout the company and then put into action. The Hoshin Canry strategic planning system originated from post-war Japan, but has since spread to the US and around the world. Translated from Japanese, Hoshin Canry aptly means compass management. The individual words Hoshin and Kanri mean direction and administration respectively. The PMI simply defined this as a strategy or policy deployment method. Hybrid approach, a combination of two or more agile and non-agile elements having a non-agile end result. Impact mapping, a strategic planning technique that acts as a roadmap to the organization while building new products. Impediment, we've covered this. It's an obstacle that prevents the team from achieving its objectives. Increment, a functional tested and accepted deliverable 
that is a subset of the overall project outcome. Incremental life cycle, an approach that provides finished deliverables that the customer may be able to use immediately. Information radiator, another creation by our friend Al, Alistair Koba, and this reads, information radiator is a visible physical display that provides information to the rest of the organization, enabling up to the minute knowledge sharing without having to disturb the team. Another definition reads, it's a term for any number of visual displays which a team places in a highly visible location so that all members can see the latest information at a glance. I-shaped, well, we talked about the broken comb and paint drip. Well, I-shaped is just one drip going down to the depth, but no broad set of scales. This refers to a person with a single deep area of specialization and no interest or skill in the rest of the skills required by the team. Iteration, a time boxed cycle of development on a product or deliverable in which all of the work that is needed to deliver value is performed. Of course, in the world of Scrum, you know that iteration is referred to as a sprint. Iterative life cycle, an approach that allows feedback for unfinished work to improve and modify that work. And if you're getting ready for the exam, you do know that the table breaking down iterative, incremental, and other life cycles is on page 18. Definitely want to master in your Agile practice guide. Kaizen events, events aimed at improvement of the system. Kanban board, a visualization tool that enables improvements to the workflow by making bottlenecks and work quantities visible. And of course, you do remember to do, doing, and done. You've seen that board before. The Kanban method is an agile method inspired by the original Kanban inventory control system and used specifically for knowledge work. Less large scale Scrum. It's a product development framework that extends Scrum with scaling guidelines while preserving the original purposes of Scrum. Lean Software Development. It has a rather risky acronym, but this means an adaptation of lean manufacturing principles. It's based on optimizing development time and resources eliminating waste, and ultimately delivering only what the product needs. The lean approach is often referred to as MVP. You've heard it before, minimal viable product. The minimum viable product strategy in which a team releases a bare minimum version of its product to the market, learns from users what they like, what they don't, what they want to be added, and then iterates based on this feedback. Next, we have a simple term, life cycle. The process through which a product is imagined, created, and put into use. Manifesto. We have talked about the manifesto. We've talked about the 12 principles. Let's now address the four values very briefly. The four values are mentioned on page eight, and they read, we are covering better ways of developing software by doing it and helping others do it. Through this work, we have come to value individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, and responding to change over following a plan. That is, while there's value in the items on the right, we value the items on the left more. Next definition is one of mobbing. Also referred to in the software world as mob programming. It's a software development method where the whole team works on the same thing at the same time 
in the same space and at the same computer. In the world of the PMI and the Agile Practice Guide, it's defined as a technique in which multiple team members focus simultaneously and coordinate their contributions on a particular work item. MVP, minimum viable product, we've talked about this already. This is the version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort. Organizational bias. The preferences of an organization on a set of scales characterized by following core values, exploration versus execution, speed versus stability, quantity versus quality, and flexibility versus predictability. Let's go to our next one, organizational change management a comprehensive cyclic and structured approach for transitioning individuals, groups, and organizations from the current state to a future state with intended business benefits. Paint drip, we've talked about this already, paint drip, broken comb, T-shaped, I-shaped, you should have all of these down. And these are skills represented by brush drawing of a horizontal stroke, Sometimes drips of paint accumulate and you know one row of that paint is gonna go all the way down while others are at different levels. And those levels represent different levels of scale, but you wanna have broad and deep skills in some and broad and enough to function. And that's what we mean by a team that can jump in to save team members when they are in trouble. You need those T-shaped skills or the paint drip or broken comb, whatever you refer to it as. I quite like the paint drip because it gives you an illustration that it's not just broad and one scale is all the way down. No, you have people who have two of the combs going all the way down. You have teams that have out of maybe 20, you have 10 really deep scales or you have a team member was just three. Pair programming. Pair programming is an agile software development technique in which two programmers work together at one workstation. One, the driver, writes code while the other, the observer or navigator, reviews each line of code. The two programmers switch roles frequently. The PMI referred to this in pair programming as pair work that is focused on programming. And that takes us to the next definition of pair work. As I described, the technique for pairing two team members to work simultaneously on the same item. Pairing, pretty much the same thing. Personas, PMI referred to this as an archetype user representing a similar, a set of similar end users described with their goals, motivations, and representative personal characteristics. Let's further expand this. The concept of Personas was first introduced by Alan Cooper and it defines an archetypal user of a system, an example of the kind of person who would interact with it. The idea is that if you want to design effective software, then it needs to be designed for a specific person. Pivot, a planned course correction designed to test a new hypothesis about the product or strategy. To go a little bit further, look at this as a structured course correction to test a new fundamental idea about a product. Plan, do, check, act, PDCA. It's an iterative management method used in organizations to facilitate the control and continual improvement of processes and products. PSI, Potentially Shippable Product Increment. In Agile Software Development, a fully tested and usable version of a product that is produced at the end of each sprint. The Agile Practice Guide remains mum on the potentially shippable increment, but we do know that this exists in the 
discussion of the exam. Predictive approach, an approach to work management that utilizes a work plan and management of that work plan throughout the life cycle of a project, also referred to as waterfall. Predictive life cycle, also referred to as waterfall, it's a more traditional approach with the bulk of planning happening up front. Product backlog already defined, an ordered list of user-centric requirements. Product owner, now this is one we should spend time on because a product owner is a very important team member. That is not to say all team members are not important, but the product owner stands out because we refer to them as the chief value officer. The product owner is accountable for maximizing the value of the product resulting from the work of the Scrum team. How this is done may vary widely across organizations, so says the Scrum Guide. The product owner is also accountable for effective product backlog management, which includes developing and explicitly communicating the product goal, creating and clearly communicating product backlog items, and ordering backlog items and ensuring the product backlog is transparent, visible, and understood. The product owner may do all the things I mentioned or may delegate some of those responsibilities. Regardless, the product owner remains accountable. Remember the word accountable from the racy chart discussion? Responsible, accountable. The responsible is the doer. The accountable passing the buck stops here. For product owners to succeed, the entire organization must respect their decisions. These decisions are visible in the content and ordering of the product backlog and through the inspectable increment and the sprint review. The product owner is one person, not a bunch of people. The product owner may represent the needs of many stakeholders in the product backlog. Those wanting to change the product backlog can do so by trying to convince the product owner. Progressive elaboration is our next one. And this is well known by a lot of you project managers. The iterative process of increasing the level of detail in a project management plan as greater amounts of information become available. PMO stands for Project Management Office. And when we talk about the Project Management Office from an Agile perspective, I would like to sensitize you to that narration in the Agile Practice Guide that talks about the role of the Project Management Office. It reads on page 82, an Agile PMO is multidisciplinary disciplinary. In order to support project specific needs, the PMO needs to be cognizant in several competencies beyond project management itself. It reads, some organizations have been transforming their PMOs into agile centers of excellence. They provide services such as developing and implementing standards, developing personnel through training and mentoring, multi-project management, multi-project management, facilitating organizational learning, managing stakeholders, recruiting, selecting and evaluating team members and executing specialized tasks for projects. So it is important for your exam when we talk about Agile and the PMO, the PMO exists to shepherd business value throughout the organization. And it might do this by helping projects achieve their goals. Sometimes the PMO should educate Know the role of the PMO for your exam. It's all there on page 81 and page 82 of the Agile Practice Guide. Let's go to our next one. This one I decided to add to the mix because I felt it was missing and it's a topic relative estimating. So whether you're using dogs or you're using story points, Fibonacci, whatever you're using, it's important that you are aware that this is just one tiny little tool in the box, but you could get it on the exam. Relative estimating consists of estimating tasks or user stories by comparison or by grouping of items of equivalent difficulty. For those of you getting ready for the exam and a lot of these terms, you're stuck, you're feeling overwhelmed, well, just read them up. Or maybe you should just go on down to agileprinciple.com Sign up for training that we've got for this at agileprinciple.com. We cover these terms in a lot more depth and our awesome instructor, Roy, he will cover this with you. 
refactoring. Refactoring consists of improving the internal structure of an existing program source code while preserving its external behavior. And that was refactoring. Let's go to our next one, retrospective. Retrospectives on a regular basis at the end of each sprint, weekly or biweekly, a retrospective allows for the team to reflect and adjust practices. Any team member can voice a problem or propose a solution. So just to double back down, that is refactoring. I should probably have read you PMI's definition of it as well. So let me read that because I got tangled up in the progress. So let me do that refactoring according to the world of the PMI. A product quality technique whereby the design of a product is improved by enhancing its maintainability and other desired attributes without altering its expected behavior. And then we talked about the retrospective. There actually is a lot more to say about a retrospective. And let me touch on the PMI's definition. It says a regularly occurring workshop in which participants explore their work and results in order to improve both process and product. But why don't we go a little step further and talk about the retrospective from the perspective of none other than the Scrum Guide. It's known as a sprint retrospective in the Scrum Guide. And the purpose of the retrospective it reads is to plan ways to increase quality and effectiveness. The Scrum team inspects how the last sprint went with regards to individuals, interactions, processes, tools, and their definition of done. Don't you like the way they slid in that manifesto line? Classic. Inspected elements often vary with the domain of work. Assumptions that led to them astray, that led them astray, are identified and their origins explored. The Scrum team discusses what went well during the sprint what problems it encountered and how those problems were or were not solved. It sounds like a lessons learned. The only difference here is that we have a term we call Agile Vegas. Whatever happened in Vegas stays there. No blame games, no crazy documentation floating around the company that Phil messed up the code, none of that. We keep everything within the retrospective. The sprint retrospective concludes the sprint. It's, it's time-boxed to a maximum of three hours for a one month sprint, for shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. And you do know that Scrum is pretty prescriptive about some things. And that's why if you read the Scrum Guide at scrumguides.org, you realize that there's a little bit more depth into their definition there. All right, let's go to rolling wave planning. Rolling wave planning is an iterative planning technique in which the work to be accomplished in the near term is planned in detail while the work in the future is planned at a higher level. Let's move on to our next one in the Agile Practice Guide, Scaled Agile Framework Safe, and it reads a knowledge base of integrated patterns for enterprise scale lean agile development. If you wanna know our perspectives on this, you want to look out for a video by my buddy Roy and I. Just Google Agile Principle Roy and Uncut. You'll hear our opinion on this. Let's move on to Scrum. Scrum is an agile framework for developing and sustaining complex products with specific roles, events, and artifacts. Scrum Board. Scrum Board is not mentioned here in the Agile Practice Guide, but Perhaps it is on the next page. Okay, Agile Practice Guide, give us what you got. It says, an information radiator that is utilized to manage the product and sprint backlogs and show the flow of work and its bottlenecks. Now I included a definition because at the time I had not picked up that one in the Agile Practice Guide. There's quite a lot in here. But the definition I have reads, it's a tool that helps teams make sprint backlog items visible. So it's not incorrect to say it's a, a radiator, information radiator, but you got to understand what it really is. It makes those sprint backlog items visible. The board can take many physical and virtual forms 
but it performs the same function regardless of how it looks. The board is updated by the team and shows all items that needs to be completed for the current sprint. And a shout out to our friend Jeff for that definition, Jeff Sutherland. All right, let's move on to our next one, the Scrum Master. This is another one that I wanna double down on. And this is in the Scrum Guide in a lot of detail. It reads, the Scrum Master is accountable for establishing Scrum as defined in the Scrum Guide. They do this by helping everyone understand Scrum theory and practice, both within the Scrum team and organization. The Scrum Master is accountable for the Scrum team's effectiveness. They do this by enabling the Scrum team to improve its practices within the Scrum framework. Scrum Masters are true leaders who serve the Scrum team and the larger organization. The Scrum Master serves a Scrum team in several ways, including coaching, helping the Scrum team focus on creating high value increments that meet the definition of done, causing the removal of impediments, ensuring that all Scrum events take place and are positive, productive, and kept within the time box. The Scrum Master serves the product owner in several ways, including helping find techniques for effective product goal definition and product backlog management, helping the Scrum team understand the need for clear and concise backlog items, helping establish empirical product planning for a complex environment. So the summary, there's so many lines to read through. It's that the Scrum Master helps out so many individuals and the team in a variety of ways. It also reads here, the Scrum Master serves the organization in several ways, including leading, training, and coaching the organization in its Scrum adoption, planning and advising Scrum implementations within the organization, and helping employees and stakeholders understand and enact an empirical approach for complex work and removing barriers between stakeholders and scrum teams. What a lot of work for the scrum master. Let's move on to our next one, scrum of scrums. The scrum of scrums is a scaled agile technique that offers a way to connect multiple teams who needs to work together to deliver complex solutions. It helps teams develop and deliver complex products through transparency, inspection, and adaption at scale. We can also look at this as a technique to scale Scrum up to larger groups over a dozen people. You know, Scrum is very particular about numbers, but if you wanna scale up Scrum, then use a Scrum of Scrums. A technique to scale Scrum up to large groups over a dozen people consisting of dividing the groups into agile teams of five to 10. Each daily Scrum within a sub team ends by designating one member as ambassador to participate in a daily meeting. I know you wanna get off this call really quick, so let me just finish the definition. Let's read from the Agile Practice Guide, it reads, a technique to operate Scrum at scale for multiple teams working on the same product, coordinating discussions of progress for their interdependencies and focusing on how to integrate this delivery of software, especially in areas of overlap. So you wanna scale Scrum up, Scrum of Scrums. Now there's, there's so much to talk about regarding the Scrum of Scrums, but I couldn't help putting in this one about the resolution of impediments. The resolution of impediments is expected to focus on the challenges of coordination between the teams. Solutions may entail agreeing to interfaces between teams, negotiating responsibility boundaries, and so on. The Scrum of Scrums will track these items via a backlog of its own, where each item contributes to improving between team coordination. All right, let's move on. The Scrum Team. This is a self-organizing team, of course, with an empowered product owner. These agile teams are composed of peers who share ownership of the team's work and decision-making pro process. Self-organizing teams in Scrum are given ownership of their own work process, their commitments, and their approach. 
to meeting their commitments. The product owner is the role in the scrum that represents the business. Of course, as you know, we've spoken about that. But again, I cannot help but give you Ken and Jeff's definition. So let's go for a quick run of it. The fundamental unit of Scrum is a small team of people, a Scrum team. The Scrum team consists of one Scrum master, one product owner, and developers. Within a Scrum team, there are no sub-teams or hierarchies. It is a cohesive unit of professionals focused on one objective at a time, the product goal. Scrum teams are cross-functional, meaning that members have all the skills necessary to create value each sprint. They are also self-managing, meaning they internally decide who does what, when, and how. The Scrum team is small enough to remain nimble and large enough to complete significant work within a sprint. Typically, now watch this, this is from the November edition of the Scrum Guide 2020, typically 10 or fewer people. So they've kind of cut that number. In general, we have found that smaller teams communicate better and are more productive. If Scrum teams become too large, they should consider reorganizing into smaller cohesive Scrum teams, each focused on the same product. Sounds like less, doesn't it? Yes, it does. All right, let's move on, my friends. We are almost done with this. I know you're itching to get off the call. Let's talk about Scrum Ban. Scrum Ban is talked about here, just like the other methods. And Scrum Ban is a combination of two things, Scrum and Kanban. And it reads here, a management framework that emerges when teams employ Scrum as the chosen way of working and use the Kanban method as a lens through which to view, understand, and continuously improve how they work. All right, we've talked about quite a lot of this stuff already, self-organizing teams. We've talked about this. It is a team, a cross-functional team in which people fluidly assume leadership as needed to achieve the team's objectives. It's nothing like organic leadership, and that happens in a self-organizing team. Next one is servant leadership, the practice of leading through service to the team by focusing on understanding and addressing the needs and development of team members in order to enable the highest possible team performance. Now, excuse me as I give you the 10 core tenets of servant leadership. Listening, empathy, healing, self-awareness, persuasion, conceptualization, foresight, stewardship, commitment to growth of people, of the team, and lastly, building community. Let's move to our next definition. It's service request manager. The service request manager, they manage the overall help desk activities. They take the overall responsibility for service request handling on the service desk. Of course, PMI has the little slant on it. It says the person responsible for ordering service request to maximize value in a continuous flow or Kanban environment, equivalent to product owner. Siloed organization an organization structured in such a way that it only manages to contribute a subset of the aspects required for delivering value to customers. Single loop learning, the practice of attempting to solve problems by just using specific predefined methods without challenging the methods in light of experience. Smoke testing, in computer programming and software testing, smoke testing is preliminary testing to reveal simple failures severe enough to reject a prospective software release. Smoke testing is also viewed as a way of deducing if the software build is stable or not. And it consists of a minimal set of tests run on each build to test software functionalities. 
the PMI call this a set of lightweight tests to ensure that the most important functions of the system under development work as intended. You get the picture. Next, we have specification by example. This is a collaborative approach to defining requirements and business oriented functional tests for software products based on capturing and illustrating requirements using realistic examples instead of abstract statements. The PMI also have their spin on this, a collaborative approach to defining requirements and business oriented functional tests. And the key word there is realistic examples. Let's go on to our next one, spike. The PMI simply defines it as a short time interval within a project, usually of fixed length during which a team conducts research or prototypes, an aspect of a solution to prove its viability. Sprint, a time box iteration in Scrum. Sprint planning, a collaborative event in Scrum in which the team, the Scrum team plans the work for the current sprint. Now you do know, as usual, I would like to introduce you to the Scrum Guide's definition and it reads, sprint planning initiates the sprint by laying out the work to be performed for the sprint. The resulting plan is created by the collaborative work of the entire Scrum team. The product owner ensures that attendees are prepared to discuss the most important product backlog items and how they map to the product goal. The Scrum team may also invite other people to attend sprint planning to provide advice. So there are topics to be covered here and they are as follows. One, why is this sprint valuable? Two, what can be done this sprint? Three, how will the chosen work get done? For each selected product backlog items, the developers plan the work necessary to create an increment that meets the definition of done. And this is done by decomposition of product backlog items into smaller work items of one day or less. How this is done is at the sole discretion of the developers. Now, when we say developers, we're not saying you have to be in software to do this. We're talking about the people who get the work done. The sprint goal, the product backlog items selected for the sprint, plus the plan for delivering them are together referred to as the sprint backlog. Sprint planning is time boxed to a maximum of eight hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. So we've talked about the sprint backlog in the past and there is sprint planning now showing on the screen. So all along, I've been talking about sprint planning and you probably got the picture. And this is where we include, of course, the whole team in the activities I described. Sprint review. The sprint review is a ceremony at the end of each sprint when completed stories are demonstrated to the team. And to indulge further, let's talk about the scrum guide and the sprint review here. It reads, the purpose of the sprint review is to inspect the outcome of the sprint and determine future adaptations. The Scrum team presents the results of their work to key stakeholders and progress, progress towards the product goal is discussed. During the event, the Scrum team and stakeholders review what was accomplished in the sprint and what has changed in the environment. Based on this information, attendees collaborate on what to do next. The product backlog may also be adjusted to meet new opportunities. The sprint review is a working session and the scrum team should avoid limiting it to a presentation. The sprint review is the second to the last event of the sprint and it's time box to a maximum of four hours for a one month sprint. For shorter sprints, the event is usually shorter. All right, and that's a sprint review. We're almost getting to the end now, story point. Now, contrary to what a lot of people think, the untrained eye thinks a story point means duration. No, it does not. So don't fall into that trap. The story point is a unitless measure used in relative user story estimating techniques. 
sustainable pace. This is not in the agile practice guide, but I decided to add it because the term sustainable pace comes up quite a lot and we see it in the manifesto. The team aims for a work pace that they would be able to sustain indefinitely, that sustainable pace. In other words, a sustainable velocity over a time period. Swarming. Swarming occurs when many team members, as many as possible, work simultaneously on the same priority item and they work on just that one until it is done. The PMI defines this as a technique in which multiple team members focus collectively on resolving a specific impediment. Let's go to our next definition, task board. Now you do not find this in the Agile Practice Guide, but a task board is really synonymous with Kanban. We divide the task board into three columns to do, doing, done, or to do in progress and done, and cards are placed in the columns to reflect the current status of that task. Honestly, the Kanban board is one of the best inventions for personal work getting done. I can testify to that. Wrote 12 books with a Kanban board. Technical debt. It's coming down to the wire now, my friends. Technical debt. PMI refers to this as the deferred cost of work not done at an earlier point in the product life cycle. You know you're in debt when you know you did it and it kind of works, but you know it wasn't done the right way. You're in debt, you gotta go back, fix it. Test-driven development, also known as TDD, is a style of programming in which three activities are tightly interwoven, coding, testing, and design in the form of refactoring. This is where we write automated tests before writing or creating the product. And it actually helps people design and mistake proof the product. The PMI's definition here reads a technique where tests are defined before work begins so that work in progress is validated continuously, enabling work with a zero defect mindset. The next is time box, a fixed period of time, for example, two weeks, three weeks, one month. The next one is T-shaped scales. We've beaten this one to a pulp on this one because not only have we talked about T-shaped, we've talked about eye shape, paint drip, broken comb. That's enough, let's move on. User story. The user story is well known in software development and it's an informal natural language description of features of a software system. They are written from the perspective of the end user. You typically see a story written such as, as a, whatever that role is, I would like, whatever that user would like, so that whatever that user story is meant to deliver. The PMI describes this briefly as a description of deliverable value for a specific user. It is a promise for a conversation to clarify details. Next, we have user story mapping, a visual practice for organizing work into a useful model to help understand the sets of high value features to be created over time, identify omissions in the backlog, and effectively plan releases that deliver value to users. Story mapping consists of ordering those user stories along two independent dimensions. The map arranges user activities along the horizontal axis in rough order of priority, or the order in which you would describe activities to explain the behavior of the system. We've only got three left, so hold on. We'll be done here shortly. UX design, UX user experience. User experience is about how a user interacts with and experiences a particular product, system, or service. It includes a person's perception of utility, ease of use, and efficiency. The PMI have their own little spin, the process of enhancing the user's experience by focusing on improving the usability and accessibility to be found in the interaction between the user and the product value stream. 
a value stream is the set of actions that take place to add value to a customer from the initial request through realization of value by the customer. The value stream begins with the initial concept, moves through various stages of development, and on through delivery and support. PMI spin reads an organizational construct that focuses on the flow of value to the customers through the delivery of specific products or services. Last but not least, in the letter V is value stream mapping. Value stream mapping is a lean enterprise technique used to document, analyze, and improve the flow of information or materials required to produce a product or service for a customer. A value stream map displays all the important steps of your work process necessary to deliver value from start to finish. Value stream mapping is also known as material and information flow mapping. My friends, it's been quite an uphill task getting through over 110 plus, going to 120 definitions for this exam. You can see why the PMP exam is often referred to as a beast. So many definitions, we had 119 of them, but we got through, so congrats to you. For those of you who are getting ready for your exam, I want to advise you, why don't you go on down to the website, praiseon.com. That is gonna help you to be able to get into a course where you can learn all of this stuff, put around really great videos, audio, books, and stuff like that. And the course I wanna to recommend to you, if you are looking for a self-study course with a few intermittent meetings to make sure you're on the right track, why don't you choose this one? It's called PMP Exam Prep Camp. And you can sign up for three months or six months. And if you need any additional content, you can see we got quarterly mentoring for PMPs to help them with the PDUs, help their focus, help them to succeed. And then we, we have a barrage of products. If you hit that link, you're gonna see many, many more products. Great stuff that is gonna help you ace this exam, smack it in the jaw, get it off your back. All right, thank you very much for joining me. Don't forget to hit like. Most importantly, don't forget to subscribe because next time I'm on, you definitely wanna join me, maybe as a PMP, who knows. See you in the next episode. You take care and bye for now.